Hello there YouTube and welcome back to another video here and today we are reviewing Fugitive of the Jadoon the huge mid kind of mid season finale like episode to be honest um, except not a mid season finale but still yeah um, this is an episode that I've been intrigued to see how the review goes because there is a heck of a lot to talk about in this episode and if you watch the episode, if not, then click off this video because spoilers will be in this video. <laughs> a lot of spoilers will be. Um, yeah, a heck of a lot happened in this um, episode, which I will be getting onto. But anyway, so let's start this review. So the episode again didn't start off with cold opening, which I was a little, which I know I like the idea of that. What Chibnall said that only some episodes would have had a cold open. And some don't when it's necessary when it's not necessary but I would like to have another cold open by now it's just it's just a preference really but yeah whatever um so but I do, I do like the way it starts off so it starts with the introduction and it sort of introduces us to the characters of Ruth and Lee and all is Alan it's a bit of an odd character to be honest yeah all is Alan he, yeah um he, uh, uh, yeah he, he was a weird guy well, it introduced us well to Ruth and Lee. Um, it has a weird, dramatic start with the toast. Shows them off as um, sort of quite normal characters. Is it Ruth going out to work and sort of saying, Mondays do your worst, which I'm pretty certain that will be Ruth. Keyword Ruth. It's the biggest regret in life, to be honest, saying do your worst Monday, because Monday certainly did its worst. Um, and then we get... So she goes out to work and we get this shot of Lee and that's something that I do love this episode, in this episode is when I was watching it I was you you kept on second guessing everyone I was at the time I was pretty certain it's Lee and then I wasn't and I was just like hang on no, hang on if this huge two when Lee turned out not to be the huge two I had no idea who it was but you just you just keep on second guessing every all the characters so if there's huge two I'm, part of me was kind of expecting it to turn on like the doctor or one of the companions or something but in the end that didn't happen well I mean if they did sort of scare the doctor they would have thought that was, she was a fugitive but this episode has like a trust no one vibe which I think was done very well and it sort of starts off with that immediately and then we have sort of like a montage of Ruth um, just having a normal normal day to be honest like um, in a town, like, trying, handing out leaflets or posts or whatever it was she's handing out, I can't remember, to people, like, on, like, a tourist attraction thing in Gloucester, I don't really know. But, yeah, it's just a fairly normal scene. Then we get in, then we uh, see uh, Lee go to All Airs Adam to buy a cake. Um, and with All Airs Adam being weird yet again. <laughs> yeah, that was, um... It's a very old character. I don't know. I just, I just couldn't stop noticing that when I watched it back. But yeah, but I forgot to switch. So earlier, when Ruth got coffee from him, it's sort of real that there's a bit of a love triangle, well, I suppose it's a love triangle between them. Um, but that kind of gets torn to shred later on in the episode. But yeah, that was um, again just interesting to see. And uh, it's then it cuts to well transitions into the Jadoon ship. And the CGI in this episode is yet again fantastic. The look, the, the design of the Jadoon ship and um, was brilliant, and the updated way that the, the updated visual effects when the Jadoon killed people that was done very well as well. Uh, it's sort of like a uh, just scene showing the Jadoon getting ready to uh, transport themselves onto the planet, and the, mu the music like the Jadoon theme and the humans their theme. Um, it's very good. Actually, they got like another soundtrack in this episode. Just phenomenal. The scene later on where the uh, new Doctor is revealed, that music is brilliant. Like Sega Nekonoda, like last season, he was a, it was good. I thought it was a, it was a good solid start. It was probably if I was rating it like six, seven out of ten. Um, but this season, it's just jumped up and it's incredible. Like music, I love the music in Spyfall. Orphan Fifty Five was a bit meh. That was very season 11 night like, music. And then Nicola says uh, Night of Terror and Fugitive of the Jadoon have both been phenomenal. Something else that I've also got to credit this for is um, the Jadoon. They looked they looked good in their previous appearances in like episodes like 
um, Smith and Jones and Prisoner of the Judoon but with Sarah Jane adventures. I can't really remember how they looked in stuff like the good a good man goes to war and Pandora Grovers, but I'm pretty sure it was very similar to Society of Smith and Jones. Or may or maybe just a rep car. But as I said, there's not a bad design of Smith and Jones. It was just it could have been better and in this episode it was. It did the look of it was much better and the animatronics for the mouth was done really well. But that the hot costume design for the Jillian was brilliant in this episode. And it then goes to a scene in the TARDIS, which again is another brilliant scene. And it's good I'm glad these scenes are actually starting to uh happen there's there there's a bit of tension created between the doctor and the companions there's a doctor there's a real there's staring at like apparently stares at the console for ages um looking for something which is then revealed to be the master um and as she can't get to the kazarvin dimension she has she's trying to look for him if he's escaped which he probably has to be honest let's let's be real it's the master he always escapes and they, they, the companions will then ask why, and then sort of doctor says she left a message, but she doesn't tell him, so it's personal. And you know, that sort of starts a bit of tension. Then she says she goes home, and the companions question why they're not going with her. And that's something that I do wonder this series is the doc, it seems to be suggesting that the doctor will. Well, I think by the end of the series, the companions will know about Gallifrey being destroyed, but if that, but well, it depends how. Is what I'm thinking of. Will it be because the doctor just ends up eventually telling them, or will it be because someone else tells them, like whoever that guy in episode seven is? Like, yeah, there's just the, that's just the question that's been coming to my mind is if ha, if the companions I'm pretty certain will know by the end of this series, but it's how they're going to know is what I'm interested in. But let me know who you think who you think that how they're going to find out. Would it be because of something that happens in the finale? Would it be some like a character like Episode Seven Bay that's quite quite a big character, possibly a time lord, possibly a timeless child, who knows? But this is stuff that I'm gonna do in the preview next week. And now I'm jumping ahead of things. But anyways, back to this episode. So um and that, that scene is cut down by the uh Jadoom, uh warning alarm, sort of saying that they're going onto Earth and putting like a level seven barrier sort of thing around Gloucester. A part of Gloucester because they're sending a, a force of enforcement field. There was seven enforcement field. That was it. But they're sending like a level se level seven um, army to do. And I can't remember the exact names. I do apologise. But down to Gloucester to find a fugitive, and the doctor's just like, nope, that, that's not happening. So they end up getting onto getting into Gloucester. But firstly, the you do get to Gloucester and. Yeah, something I've got to say about the you doing in this episode, they were really ruthless, which I love to see, because like in previous episodes, the Jadoon just sort of seemed like trigger happy police, as the Doctor said, but they felt really ruthless, and like with the motive of uh, getting the job done, no matter the cost, or how they do it, they just get the j job done, which is a side of the Jadoon that was never really sort of focused on too much, it was sort of said, but... Not really, and they're more like mercenaries in this episode, which I do love. And the Jadoon in this, as much as they do get pushed to the side, they still were very good in this episode. As they were ruthless, they were threatening, they felt very Jadoon like. And there was a couple of good scenes with the uh, woman when she sort of runs away from the Jadoon and she doesn't want to get scanned, they just go bang, shoot her, and she's dead. And then with All Is Alan, when he sort of pushes the Jadoon. Um, and then he, and then they just sentence him, sentence him to execution. Yeah, so considering their role, and as I said, they get pushed aside. The Jadoon did very well in this episode, and it was really good seeing them again. Like, we haven't seen them since the Magician's Apprentice, I believe it was. I'm pretty certain they appeared in that. At, like the very start of that episode, I'm pretty certain they were last in. And they've played very minor roles since, like they've appeared in The Good Man Goes to War, appeared in Pack Dorica Opens, but just in very minor roles. And even the Stolen Nerf is quite a small role as well. And the End of Time Part 2, they were in as well. So they haven't really had a big role like since their debut. Um, so it's really nice seeing them again in a major role. I say major, but yeah. Considering everything that goes on this episode, they don't even feel that big.
That just shows how ridiculous this episode is. Now, and something that I've got to say is that the Doctor in this episode was actually is was actually phenomenal. Like as I said, like her last um, like from Resolution, I really liked her character. And she's been getting better since. And Spyfall, she's really good. Well, Spyfall Part One, she's good. Spyfall Part Two, she has some great scenes. Orphan Fifty Five, she was good. Nicola Tesla's Night Terror, she's really good in that. And this one, she's just brilliant. She was. She had so many stand. She had so many brilliant scenes, and she really felt. She really had brought that presence to, with her, especially in scenes later on, which would have been more difficult considering what happened. I mean, now we're getting to see some more darker sides of her, which is a side that I li I'm actually really enjoying seeing. Um, of course, we never really saw this in series eleven. The only time we really saw it was a glance at it in Resolution, but it wasn't really anything. But I was thinking about this the other day. I'm like loving this sort of darker side of Jodie. I really do like this sort of growth in character that she's having in this series, and I'm just hoping that it keeps them going on. And as the practices can you hear in the episode eight and episode nine and episode ten, which Tyler's having confirmed, um, I'm hoping that it just continues to get better and better from there and on. But the Doctor's first um, interaction with the Doom is uh, a very good scene. It was sort of like comedic but in the right way and it felt like a very doctoring method as well to stop the gun being used because apparently that was a very bad weapon and would have had disastrous consequences this there was also this is a good opportunity for Yaz as well which I feel um, but she didn't really she, she like, had a couple of scenes where she sort of used her police knowledge um, to like distract the you do but it, it never really gone anywhere, and when it seemed like it might, oh, she got teleported up onto the ship. Um, and speaking of, I'm going to get up to that. So, Doctor and Yaz and Ryan persuaded Jadoon to uh, talk to Ruth and Lee before they uh, open fire. And then it realizes that Graham's not with them, and it shows Graham on that ship. At the time, I well, I was curious what this place was, but I thought it might be a TARDIS. Um, and a part of me, like, thinking back to it, if I was kind of, like, feeling like it could have been the Master's TARDIS. If the Master's going to come back in this episode, that would have been where he would have. Of course, he didn't. Because, and the, uh, the ship's speaker systems turn on, and you hear this beautiful American accent talking to Graham, sort of saying that, don't move, you get killed, hang on, they neutralise coming to join you can get excited now somehow at that point i still didn't recognize that who it was but then it teleports in ah oh, and it turns out to be john barrowman captain jack harkness is packing doctor who and that's i still can't believe it the reveal scene of jack harkness was perfect and he looks I, and it just fit, it just, oh, that whole scene was just done perfectly, and it just, it just, he looks great in his coat, his shirt, he's, oh, it, it's just brilliant, I, I was so happy to see him back in this episode, and he was just, he, he's, he was characterised perfectly as well, there was a part of his character that didn't feel right, which isn't a surprise considering Chibnall's written a project. And eight episodes in the past in Tortures. He wrote it for Day One, Countryside, um, Cyberwoman, End of Days, uh, Kiss Kiss Him, Bang Bang, Adrift, Fragments, and Exit Wounds. All the episodes that he's written for Tortures. So he's written for Jack in quite a few occasions. So I'm not surprised that he that he got the character so right. And this episode is co-written but with well from Ch Chris Chibnall and Vinay Patel. I'm assuming that all the Captain Jack scenes was written by Chris Chibnall and most of the Jadoon stuff was written by Vinay Patel. So he teleports down and sort of in a very Jack skull style, winks at Graham, goes over to him and then sort of snogs Graham. It's just, a, just perfect for John ba for John Barrowman's return to Doctor Who. But then but he's doing that because he thinks Graham is the Doctor, which is just a really funny scene to see. Uh, it cuts back to Doctor Yaz and Ryan heading into Ruth and Lee's house. 
Okay, so on to the next point. So, um, we cut back to, so once that scene's done, we cut back to stuff that's happening with Jack and Graham. Um, and Jack sort of double checks that Graham isn't lying about not being the doctor and then sort of says that she needs, to, well, he needs to so know something and Graham obviously reveals that she's no longer a man, she's now a woman. And Jack's reaction to that, I was got to say, it's perfect. It's very Jack and... Yeah, and he just sort of runs off excited and goes, Oh, this I gotta see. It's just it's a perfect reaction from that from Jack for that. And something that's just difficult is um at the start of his story he has actually seemed like she might have quite a good role in this. Sort of like June obviously being part of the police and her being a policewoman. Might actually see something from Yaz, but the, when she goes out to stop the doom from using the weapon and sort of informs them that they can go in the the one scene where she feels like she, she okay so on to the next point so um we cut back to, so once that scene's done we cut back to stuff that's happening with Jack and Graham um and Jack sort of double checks that Graham isn't lying about not being the doctor and then sort of says that she needs to, well he needs to so know something and Graham obviously reveals that she's no longer a man she's now a woman and Jack's reaction to that I was gotta say, it's perfect. It's very Jack, and yeah, and he just sort of runs off excited and goes, "Oh, this I gotta see." It's just, it's a perfect reaction from that, from Jack for that. And something that's just difficult is um, at the start of his story, he has actually seemed like she might have quite a good role in this. Sort of like June, obviously being part of the police and her being a policewoman, might actually see something from Yaz, but. <laughs> When she goes out to stop the doom from using the weapon and sort of informs them that they can go in, the the one scene where she feels like she she might actually have hope for this episode, she with, with stuff to do, she gets teleported away to Jack's ship, which is not typical. Um, then so then the doom go into the room and see Lee where he surrenders, then Gat comes down. Um, who we don't really know anything about at this point. We assume, we're left to assume that she's uh, employed by the Jadoon, as we know she isn't. Um, and then they have a nice confrontation scene with each other, and watching the back, you know, you, you work, well, actually, you could work out just at the end of the episode that they are both Time Lords. Um, as Gat says, they have the same training, which says they're part of the Time Lord. Uh, oh God, I mean, I've forgotten the names of them, but yeah, they're part of the uh, t Time Lord Army thing. And then seeing um, Lee gets killed by Gat out of cold blood. And it was, you know, a little bit sad to see him go, since I thought I quite liked his character. Actually, all the side characters in this were quite good, and I weird and but funny with all these Alan. Or just a good side character, like Lee and Ruth. Although there's more to Ruth that meets the eye, as we will find out later. We then go to back to more Jack, and you can't have you, you can't have too much Jack. Uh, um, to be honest, um, and it's when that he reacts, and I just like again, I love his reaction to Free Companions because it is just like exactly what the fan base is when he just goes free of you, gone, and I'm just like yes, Jack, we know this is there's a heck of a lot of them. And we'll watch it doesn't work most of the time. But in this episode, there are so many, like, typical Jack one-liners. Uh, like, when he explains how he's got the ship, he's just like, Oh, that was a night. Actually, that was a month. And, of course, when he first meets Graham, goes, <laughs> the first thing he does, assuming that he's the Doctor, and just goes and snogs him. Just, Jack was written so perfectly in this episode, and he, he's fit back into the role perfectly after being out of it for nine years. So it's insane, and definitely too long. And things, so after oh, after this point, we're like, Jack, Jack's been back, we're just like, that's enough, surely it can't be bigger from there. But then things start to build up again when you're doing, walk into the cathedral, like c Circle, the Doctor and Roof, um... And then reveal that Ruth is the fugitive. It would be been interesting if they actually scanned uh, Jodie at that point, because obviously she's she would come like be classed as a fugitive as well. So that that would have been quite interesting if that happened. That just occurred to my mind when I rewatched really the episode.
Uh, yeah, she's sort of like, it's like her inward doc, well, docks her, comes out and then it's, fights the Jadoon, takes the gun, rips off its horn, which was a cool scene to see, and makes them teleport back, which starts a new, well, makes the Jadoon think that needs to change their tactics up, as they say, which is something that did sort of like a nitpick that, about this, is that the Jadoon didn't really come back with any tactics. But I am, I'm assuming that was at Gat's command, but I just, yeah. We then switch back to Jack, um, I can't actually remember what happens in that scene. It's probably quite bad. Oh yeah, that Jack, Jack obviously, uh, talks with Ryan, um, yeah, no, just being typical Jack, uh, having good chemistry with the companions. Sort of saying Ryan's his favourite, is a mouthy one, and Jack the cheesy one, of course. And there's a lovely bit of directing here from uh, Nida Manzor, although, just fun fact, the scenes with Captain Jack weren't actually directed by Nida Manzor, they were directed by Jamie Magnus Stone, so, yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, it's like brilliant, br brilliant, well, it's well written, but it's uh, brilliantly directed when it's sort of, Jack says, is she okay? And it cuts off and off a picture, off a sort of view of zooming out away from the roof. Like, at the time, that shot wouldn't really mean much, but when you watch it back, it's sort of going, oh, is she, uh, is she okay? And it's a really struggling. So, yeah, it's it. that was a really clever, cleverly taken shot, and it's one that I really appreciated on rewatch. Then, in the scene with Ruth and the Doctor, we're sort of revealed to know that whatever is going on with Ruth it has something to do with the lighthouse, so they need to go there. And we go back to Jack, where more is revealed in relation to what we now, well, what we presume that most of it is in the finale. The titles have been revealed, um, which is the Ascension of Cybermen and Timeless Children. Quite cool titles, I do like them. Anyways, um, but it's then, it, it sort of talks about, so that there's three bits of what he says, which is really intriguing. It's the way he describes the Cybermen as a fallen empire, which isn't a way that we've ever heard the Cybermen described before. So it's interesting that he, he described them as that, a fallen empire. I mean, as uh, as ridiculous as it got, and as much as I don't like the episode, Nightmare and Silver still is part of the Doctor's history, and it shows uh, and uh, it shows the extremities of how they can upgrade themselves and the efficiency of it. So Fallen Empire makes me think that they done they've upgraded themselves quite a lot. We've seen in a recently released uh, um, still to come trailer that there's the new design which I think looks awesome by the way. But I think that Fallen Empire thing is just a thing to remember going into episode 9. Or even episode 8, which is an episode that they're rumoured to re returning. And it is possible as that episode is also co-written by Chris Chibnall. Although saying that, Praxius was also co-written by Chibnall. And I can't work out what bits he was involved in since the episode could have been written by Pete McTeague and you wouldn't thought much of it. As there's genuinely no plot relevance in that at all. Ser series arc, sorry. Yeah, it was just an interesting way to word it, Fallen Empire. And then also what you said about um, the people who sent it back to destroy the Cybermen was the Alliance. And now what, what could the Alliance be? I mean, people have been saying that there was a faction on Earth in Earthshock, which is called the Alliance. Which, when I first heard that, I was just like, no, that's quite a small thing for something that sounds quite big and cool. But then we what we've heard about Ascension of Cybermen and the uh, synopsis of that, it kind of makes me think that it might be just the faction of humans um, from Earthshock, which, if you don't know, I'm, pro I'm not going to lie, I'm probably not your best source of information for this, but the, the uh, Alliance were the group of people, I, I'm pretty certain of this, um, the group of people that were fighting the cyber, Cybermen, I think, I and they weren't fighting the Cybermen, so they were a, they, they were like a group or organisation or something, I can't exactly remember, it's been a long time since I watched Earthshock, but they, 
they were the people they, they sent an archaeological team to dis discover the look through these tunnels where I think there were reported signs of something mysterious going on in there. No, I don't. I don't think I'm pretty certain it won't be from the same time period, but it could be more of a developed version as we know it's, it's this faction of humans that have been in this long war between the side men. So, at most, I feel like if it is that, it won't be a reference. But there's, I, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that's not since that'll be quite a waste of something that sounds quite big as the alliance. Anyway, and now to the big thing, the thing that we've. Well, we knew there were Cybermen at Falk since uh, way back when the first trailer was re was released. And the design for that looks awesome again. Um, but now we know that, well, we presume that is, the, the rusty Cybermen is the lone, what, what was called the lone Cybermen. Um, so the lone Cybermen, it's an interesting name because we've never really had this sort of thing. We've had like Cyber Leaders and cyber kings and stuff like that but we've never really had some like a mythical cyberman something that's sort of a legend and sort of what we presume is much more powerful than the everyday cyberman the cybermen are generally just one thing with someone in command and it's just this all-powerful army that goes around upgrading the universe to make as many of themselves as they can but the Lone Cyberman sounds like this, what I presume is going to be a very, very old Cyberman, like it's been around for a while. And it's, Jack said to stop it from getting what it wants, and as the synopsis says, that there, and as Tribunal has said um, about Episode 9, is that there will be an army of Cybermen. That's it. And I don't think we'll start off the episode of this army of Cybermen, we'll start off, probably start off with this faction of Cybermen, but as... As the synopsis said, that there, there was this war going on. So it's probably not too many left, because I don't think there's too many humans left. Um, but what the si lone Cybermen wants is the, what some sort of object or power source or force or just something that can revive the Cyber Army and make it all powerful again. Which what I think, and I think he will get that in the episode. And that creates the uh, Cybermen that we've seen in the trailers. It's my theory, but there's... I can't... I really have a theory for why this Cyberman is called the Lone Cyberman. But it's... I think it's going to be like the Cyberman ver version of the Cult of Scarrow. But... Yeah, it's... It's an interesting one, but it's one that I don't really have a great theory for. Yeah. Jack ends up teleporting away his nanogenes, which is a nice reference back to that. Um, and then we cut back to the Doctor and Ruth um, in the car, making their way to the lighthouse. And they have a conversation with the Doctor, testing Ruth about her past and seeing what her knowledge is like. Um, and yes, I will say this is probably one of my favourite scenes, up there with one of my favourite scenes of Doctor Who, because it's just brilliantly written, brilliantly shot. The music for it is superb as well. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's probably up there. Like, it's probably been the best music that we've gotten since Breaking the Wall was released. But the whole scene, the whole build-up scene to Ruth being revealed as the Doctor was brilliant. Um, I had some brilliant shots. That one that swelled around the lighthouse, sort of hinting at that late, that later bit of dialogue from Jody. That time is swirling around me, considering that was one of the key factors. Probably I've heard sort of thinking like that. Again, brilliant directing from Nita Manzo, who done a great job with this episode. Yeah, she sort of stands at the lighthouse and just looks at the gravestone, scans it, realizes it's an empty gravestone, starts digging it up. And she finds that that she she hits something solid, starts digging it up, and finds out that it's the TARDIS, and then. Um, and it's her TARDIS, it's a police box. And that's a, quite a key factor for who Ruth could be. But we still don't know, of course. But it, it's... For me, at least, that kind of rules out the possibility of her being before Hartnell. Since, as, as you know, if you've watched An, An Unearthly Child, 
in, it was in that episode where the TARDIS stayed as a police box because he, the Doctor is surprised um, that the chameleon circuit has gotten stuck and of course it just stayed like that for the rest of the time pretty, more or less apart from a couple of times I can tackle a Sidemen so for me that rules out the possibility of Roos Doctor being before um, William Hartnell and even though we've we've got in the past like big continuity errors like, and stuff like the whole hybrid thing and that being the reason Doctor ran away that was going against some previously like fixed Doctor Who history but I mean as we know Chibnall was a big fan of the show and this information was from the very first episode of Doctor Who so I can't see him getting something like that wrong. I feel like if he, if he did plan for Ruth Ruth Doctor to be before um, Hartnell's era, then he would have made sure that the police box was in the police box, and it was the sky, it, the communion circuit was still working. As I know, I've always got to do is just I've got to credit Joe Martin for her performance as the Doctor because she fits straight into the shoes of the Doctor perfectly, and straight from as soon as she's revealed to be a Doctor, she feels like. The Doctor. Maybe not the one we know, but she certainly does feel like the Doctor. And that's not an easy task to do to fit right in that well. Um, so yeah, her performance as Doctor was brilliant. And actually, her her Doctor, she was written really well. Like, considering the issues that we've had with Jodian, and the fact that it took so long for, like, some sort of development to happen to her character. Like, Chris Chibnall has, like, really written, like, these sort of characters well, like the Master written perfectly. The Jadoon were great in this as well. Probably the best we've seen of the Jadoon even though they felt they felt like they were put to the, pushed to the side considering how much happens in this episode. And Joe Martin's The Docs was just brilliant. Yeah, but, but see, speaking of Jodie, she was always brilliant in this, in this episode. She had brilliant scenes as, as previously stated. Her acting was brilliant. This is probably her best episode yet and this series, like, I've been loving her doctor, like, sort of seeing all these new sides of her, seeing the push to different, these sort of positions, it's just, yeah, she, she's been brilliant in this series, and she continued that, continued that to this episode, and took another step up. Now, from the following scene, some interesting questions were brought up. Um, so, firstly, that, well, who are you doing working for? Because as Gat said, um, this this is way beyond her. That's it. that's saying it's something pretty damn big, and it's got to be something that's killed the Doctor as well. Um, most likely related to the Timeless Child, but what exactly? Eh, who knows? And if they're in, and if she's in the past, then how is she in the past? Um, as Jodie seems to work it out by saying that, um, by the by them. Being tired wasn't t wanting to take the doctor to Gallifrey, and then obviously with our doctor Jodie Whittaker, she Gallifrey is destroyed, so that means that they're in the past. But how? As I said, I've already ruled for me. I've ruled out with it her being pre Hartnell, but that means that she's in between someone else. How? Yeah, I'm, I'm through this to be honest. And something else is that the clothes that Gap wear is wearing is different to what we usually see in Time Lords wear. Just something to note. Just, yeah, it's not the usual Time Lords uniform. And whenever the Time Lords died, there was no regeneration. Of course, you, there was an obvious reason for that that you could easily use by just saying that they are Time Lords. They probably know how to kill each other and just set the gun on a different setting that will... Um, kill them without any po possibility of regeneration. Um, but yeah, there were some interesting questions brought up from that scene, and then it ends off by Ruth killing um, Gat. Not directly though, but still having a still with the intention being that we're switching the gun around um, to, so it fires backwards instead of forwards, which maybe hints at the possibility that this is. Maybe sometime, sometime uh, like close to the War Doctor, perhaps, or it could just be post Whitaker. Sometime that some somewhere down the line, 
but you don't really see the ducks with mo morals like that. Um, but then again, if it's around about War Doctor time, it can't be. It can't be pre. Um, can't be like pre hurts and well, well it could be. Pre well, it can't, no, it can't be pre hurt as we saw um, all the generations up to that point. And it can't. And it can't be actually. Actually, no. That, no, that's a room that I'm ruling out because it can't be after John Hurt as well because. Um, they didn't. When she mentioned the war, they didn't seem like they didn't recognize that at all. Yeah, then we have another. We have a brilliant scene then when um, Doctor leaves Ruth and is just worried about herself as she does. She feels like she doesn't know her own past anymore. Um, it's a brilliant, beautiful scene with her and her companions. Um, and a speech from Ryan. So yeah, it was overall a brilliant episode, and in my opinion, it was the best episode of the Chibnall era. Um, yeah, it has some shocking revelations, brilliant, brilliant to see Jack back, left us with lots of questions, and we're all looking for, for, forward to the finale for that, for answers. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't see anything really wrong with this episode, maybe one or two nitpicks, but it doesn't really bother me at all, really. So this episode is, I'm going to rate it a 10 out of 10, and it's the first 10 I've given since The Doctor Falls. So it's been quite a while since we've had a 10 out of 10, but this episode definitely deserves it. Brilliantly written, brilliantly acted, brilliantly directed, just everything's brilliant about it. And just the, yeah, as I said, these lots of questions um, are wanting answers. So, and hopefully we'll get some by the end of this series. But anyways, that's, thank you for watching this video. Um, hope. Hopefully, I'm going to try and get the review for Praxis done before Can You Hear Me airs tomorrow, but we'll have to see. Um, there will be a Can You Hear Me preview coming up as well. I do apologise for not being one for Praxis, but stuff's been going on, so I took a break from YouTube for a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm now going to try and do my best to catch up and hopefully get Praxis review with you before the, tomorrow's episode, so we're back on track by the time we watch can you hear me but anyway so yeah apart from that i'll um see you in the next video goodbye